Doesn't that just do something to you? It certainly does. Let us bow now in prayer. Lord, as it's been expressed to us in this lovely hymn, how great thou art. And we think this morning, what would we do if it wasn't for you? And then when we think that you were so great, and then your love constrained you to be so mindful of us, then my soul can scarcely take it in. It's true. I pray that you'll bless us today now as we further go into the service, that you'd break to us the bread of life, which is the revelation of Christ. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ungren is a constant comer to the tabernacle, and he lives in Memphis, Tennessee. He and his mother, his wife, and the whole family comes to the tabernacle, and very seldom I get to hear him because it's always so busy. But this morning, I was determined to hear him sing this song. And he sings another one of my favorites, Down From His Glory, and them are my favorite songs. And I had the grand privilege of meeting his father this morning, the first time I've ever had that privilege, a fine man. And, um, and Brother Ungren, his father, will, will never go as long as his son lives, Morris, because he certainly look alike. And um, I've, his wife, Brother Morris Ungren's mother, has just lived these last 15 years by the grace of God. She certainly has been a great inspiration to me to see that going through the dark hours that she has and yet holding on to God's unchanging hand, it expresses to us the genuineness of Christianity and the faith of those that believe it. So I'm very happy for that this morning. We just had a wedding downstairs. Uh, two of my children got married. And uh, my children from the tabernacle, uh, little Billy Simpson, a little Myers girl, they've been sweethearts for some time, Cheryl, yes. Um, they were, they're also our relative here, the little Cheryl Myers is uh, to Brother Ungren and that. So we are happy for them. I see they've taken their place after getting married, go right back in the auditorium of the church and sit down and listen to the service. Those children have always had a deep place in my heart because they're so respective to the Word. They, they just love the Word. I don't think that, that I call them my children. I don't think they're any better than other children. But they just look to me, and I, I, I look to God for them. Little Billy wanted to get married, and then he's afraid he's going to have to go with the army. And there's two or three of them in that same condition. And those boys come over to me and said, Brother Branham... We, uh, we don't want to be shirkers or anything, but we would like for you to ask God. And they'd give me the basis that they'd like to stay away from the army if they could. Not because they didn't want to defend the country and anything they could do. But the thing was that if they, if they went, they was going to get among the wrong type of people out there. And there was, uh, I don't know what you call it, PXs or whatever what you call it. And then to get out there were those half-nude women carrying on no place for a Christian boy. And um, so God granted their request. And now little Billy comes this morning to be married to this fine little Cheryl. So we're happy for them, and we wish them the very best and God's kingdom for them. And now, this has been a grand time for us. We got a nice Sunday school class here this morning, a packed out church. So we're very happy and and many times, ministers, it, it encourages us to see that people come and hear you. Because, you see, you don't like to speak to empty pews because we'd speak just the same if there's one person here. But yet, it feels good when you think, if this one misses it, the other one will get it, you see. And it makes it different. Makes it a glorious. Now, just in the interviews just now, this is if we can run into them as fast uh, I met Brother Bootlayer when I come out. I hadn't seen him since being there. I said, where you been? He said, getting turkey dinner ready for them. And so um, um, I was telling him I'd lost from my... He said, you, I said, you haven't changed a bit. He said, neither of you. I said, that's really diplomacy. I said, but you know, I have. I went from 170 to 145. So I sure have changed. 
my suits all too little or too big for me and someone just got me one the other day so I could wear it down here one it didn't hang off on the shoulders and the waistline lap over but um, I'm trying to do my very best for Jesus Christ while I have a chance to do it and your fine attendance I was telling him in the room just now uh, seen the great Holy Spirit remove a cancer from a woman's body right in there she's a she's a woman from Texas and um a lady sat there that I never seen a person more nervous, a minister's wife, just a few moments ago. And the Lord showed me a vision of her sitting there, and I seen her, she called at New York. She wanted to slip up here, she had just one five minutes. And seen her husband suffering with an ulcer. And what caused the ulcer was his interest in his wife. Almighty God quieted that woman sitting there. She's sitting looking at me now. So and also, I want to tell you, brother, your ulcer is finished. <laughs> you're, you're going to be well now and return into the work of the Lord. Now, when you see something that the Lord does, it, you, you just can't fill up on it. You just want to keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And now, last night we had a great prayer service. And that's good. That's fine, laying hands upon the sick. That's a good thing. That's all it takes sometimes. And then there's some, that, there's something back there that they, they can't catch. And you've got to get that person to find out what that is. See, there's something that's hindering them. Something laying in the way. And one little shadow will vibrate it away. Now, the little lady in there a few moments ago, she was so nervous, so upset. Poor little fella, she couldn't even get her breath. She was just, and just, just carrying on. See? Now, the thing you have to do, here's just a little inside scene. It's catching her spirit. See? And then you are projecting to her your very thought. See? And you change your thinking. See? And then when it does that, then you can sit her on Christ and from there she can go on. But you've got to change her way of thinking. See, She can't change it herself. She's just running a whirl. And you've got to pick that up. Now there's a little something that give you something. Don't try to study it. Don't do it. Just believe it and go on. How could that little baby laying under that mother's arms have been dead since nine o'clock that morning and just way in the night that night? Where was that little spirit? You have to go find that spirit and bring it back. And then when you see it on coming back, then you can rise in the name of the Lord and call it. See? Then it'll happen. But till you do that, you're just wasting your breath. See? It's nothing, nothing so mysterious. It's finding God. You're getting yourself out of the way and letting the Holy Spirit use you to whatever He wants to do. That's it. The main thing of any gift is getting your own ideas away and let Christ. Then whatever it said, uh, if you want to know where it's Christ or not, it's just a sensation, leave it alone. But if it's just uh, an emotion, leave that alone. But if it's written in the Word, then it's God. Always judge everything that any spirit tells you by the Word. The word. Don't never get away from that word. If you do, you're lost. Now, before we stay till noontime, just talking like that, let's just uh, turn over in the Bible and read some scriptures here. And then we're going to... I love God's word. I know we all do. Now, I didn't have... I was going to preach this morning or talk, teach the Sunday school on the hidden mysteries of God since the foundation of the world being revealed in Jesus Christ. And I didn't get a chance to run it all out. I forgot about the wedding coming. So I, I maybe get that the next time coming by. Now I'm going to read some out of three places in the Bible. The first I want to read from Philippians 1, uh, the first chapter of Philippians, beginning with the 19th verse and reading also to the 22nd. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectations and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always so now also Christ shall be manifested in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, 
This is the fruit of my labor, yet what I choose I won't not. Now, over in the book of Romans, and we won't begin at the 8th chapter of Romans and the 35th verse to build on what I want to take for a text. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress, persecutions, famine or nakedness, peril, sword? As it is written, For my sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, neither our height, depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in Acts 2 and the 30th verse. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God is swore with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to set on his throne. Now, this is much scripture, kindly going around from one place to another in the Bible, but we know that if this much scripture has been read... We're going to find something in there that's going to, to help us. And may God help us now, as I would like to take this subject uh, this morning as the word of absolute, an absolute. Now, we, when I was looking this uh, text up, I went to the dictionary. I thought, what? Uh, somebody keeps saying, that's absolute, the truth. Absolute, this is it. I thought, what is that word? What does it mean? Absolute. And I went to the uh, dictionary to find out what it meant. Webster says, it is perfect in itself, unlimited in its power, primarily an ultimate. See, unlimited in its power, perfect in itself, and it really is an ultimate. The word absolute. And I'd like to say this and trust that you'll catch these words because I'm not a trained clergyman in how to, in a psychological way to bring a fascinating something that would hold the people. The only thing I do is try to do the best that I can on account of the friends that Christ has given me and I, I, I want them to see what my thought is about Christ. Now, every great achievement is tied to an absolute. You cannot run life without having an absolute. You can't make an achievement without it being an absolute. For it is the final tie post. It's the, it's the hitch rack at the end of the journey. It's a place where you are tied to something. And the day that we're living in now, and everything is so breaking up, so fragile and carried away, I think that this message would be a very appropriate thing, especially to Christians. When they are going through their deep waters now, the Christian church is passing through the deepest water it's had for the last 2,000 years. Because we are coming to a spot to where... There's something presented to Christianity, uh, uh, something they have to make a decision on. And I think that the Christian church ought to have something that they know that they're tied to instead of just floating about like a leaf upon the water. The wind, as the Bible said, carried about by every wind of doctrine. The winds come and blow the little leaf this way, and then another wind comes, the north wind, the south wind, the east wind, the west wind. You'll never get anywhere. You're not stabled. The Christian life should be a stabled life. It should be something that's 
It's a principle that, that you are uh, tied to that is more than life itself. And you must uh, uh, have something that you're tied to. Some people are tied to their business. Some are tied to their families. Some are tied to a creed. Some are tied to the army post. We have different things that we are tied to. But I think as a Christian, we ought to be tied where we know is right. Because you might be tied to your family and your, your wife could leave you. You might be tied to the army and you might get killed. And you might be tied uh, to any different things and it's got an end. But there's got to be a final tie post. There's got to be somewhere that that man has got to tie for his eternal destination. Because if you're going to trust it in your work, when your work is finished, it's done. When your family's taken, it's over. But there's only one thing that I think uh, as a final tie post, and I believe that Paul had a tie post in his life here. And I'd like to, to side in, if we call it that way, and speak on that tie post. He said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now, Christ was Paul's absolute. It was his tie post. It was, his, it was the, the end of all arguments. It was Christ was his tie post. Paul didn't always have that tie post. He used to be tied to the group of the Pharisees. And he had to be trained and educated so that they would accept him and let him tie himself to their post. But one day, he was on the road down to Damascus. And he met Jesus face to face. And from there he cut loose from his Pharisee tie post and retied himself again. That Jesus who he knew was crucified, died and rose again, Paul knew it because he met the person. That changed him right there. He was never the same from then on. He never just met a book. He never just met a... A uh, creed, he met the person, Jesus Christ. Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Let's uh, think of that conversion for a few moments. I believe Paul was a sincere man. Be it this is Sunday school, we want to teach it like a Sunday school. Uh, Paul, I believe, was a deep, sincere man. He, there, was, there was nothing about him that was any different from anyone else. All those prophets were men just like we are. The Bible said so, St. James 5. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He had his ups and downs, his ins and outs. And uh, he prayed earnestly it might not rain. And Paul was the same kind of a man like we are. He had his frustrations, his doubt, and he was an honest man. He was going to one of the finest sect of, of religions that there was in the world. And he was becoming a teacher of that sect. Taught under a great teacher, Gamaliel which is one of the most uh, uh, greatest teachers they had of the day. His parents seen to it, seen that there was something in Paul's life and worked hard and sent him away to school that he might be taught in all the laws of God. And with a deep sincerity, he believed every word of it. And he had heard of this kind of a lower class of people and how there had been a prophet so-called by his group that had raised up in Galilee that was supposed to perform miracles and heal the sick. But his, his sect that he belonged to would not accept this man of being a prophet, this Jesus of Nazareth, because he had not identified himself with them. So it, it, Paul couldn't go it because his own sect of, of people didn't uh, believe in it. And they had warned him against such. And Paul, being honest, thought, if this thing is not of God and my... Uh, church says it's not of God, then there's only one thing to do is get rid of it. They get it out of the way because it's a, 
It would be a hindrance. It would be a growth, a malignancy uh, against his sect of believing. So he purposed in his heart that he would go out and cut this malignancy, as he called it or his church called it, away from his fine Pharisee group. One day, with letters in his pocket from the high priest, to arrest all those people that were in that condition because that would have been the charge that Paul was set to. He was on his road down to a city called Damascus. They had him quieting down around Jerusalem. So he had, he had stoned Stephen's, and Paul had him stoned, give witness and help the coat. Now he'd go down here and do the same thing and get rid of this great hindrance. But about must have been about noontime, around 11, 12 o'clock, he was stricken down. And when he did, he looked up and there was a light standing before him. And a voice coming out of this light saying, Saul, Saul, a question. Why are you persecuting me? Now, Paul knew, or Saul rather, knew that his people had been following that same light since they come up out of Egypt. And if uh, did you ever see the Lams, the translation of the Bible, the old, the, the old Hebrew sign of, uh, of God is a triangle light, more or less something like that, that the three uh, attributes of God in one Godhead. And this triangle light, the three in one being one God, was uh, a sign to the Hebrew of God, light. And then when Moses met him in the bush, then he said, I am, which remains the same three yesterday, today, and forever, still the same God. And Moses met him in the burning bush. He was a light. And when uh, he led the children of Israel out of the wilderness, he was the angel of the covenant that Moses by faith saw and forsook Egypt, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater treasures than that of Egypt. By faith, Moses saw that that was Christ the uh, anointing. And the anointing was up on no certain man, but it was in a form of a pillar of fire. See? And then that same anointing came down at his baptism and went into Christ and dwelt in him. John knew it was him. He said, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit that led them out of Egypt into the wilderness and out of the wilderness into the promised land, Upon whom thou shalt see this triangle form of God coming down and remaining on. He is the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, Paul hadn't been privileged of seeing this yet. But just to make it true to you, the Jews were so forbidden to bow before an idol or anything like that. Now, when he saw this great light, He knew that that was the Lord. Lord means ownership, control all. He he would have not called just anything Lord, that staunched Hebrew, when he knew that that was spirit. But notice, he knew that that same pillar of fire had been the one that had led his people. And then he comes back and said, Lord, who are you? Who are you? I want to know who you are. You met Moses in the name of I am. But now stop there with their thought just a minute. Jesus, when he was on earth, anointed with that that they saw. Notice, he said, I come from God. The Spirit, the light, the pillar of fire. And I return to God. And he was made flesh in order to die for our sins. Then after his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension... After he ascended up on the 40 days, he ascended up, and on the 50th day, he returned back in the form of a pillar of fire among the people and separated himself like tongues of fire and set up on each of them. And then they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, God separating himself, God first in a great pillar of fire. God manifested in a human body. Now, God separating Himself among His people. The pillar of fire breaking up. 
and setting up on each of them like forked licks of blazes, cloven tongues set up on them, forks of fire, cloven tongues like fire set up on each of them, and they were all filled with that and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, you see, we are not a divided people. We've got to be in unity because each one of us holding a part of God. And we must come together. And then the pillar of fire is manifested in the wholeness and the fullness of it. When His church sets together in heavenly places, then the fullness of the power of God is in His church. Each one of us holding spiritual gifts and spiritual offices coming together brings that pillar of fire back again. And Paul recognized that being uh, the Lord. And he said, Lord, who are ye if I'm persecuting you? He said, I'm Jesus. And it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And Paul was commanded to rise and go down in the street called Straight. And there was a prophet there who came up by the name of Ananias or saw a vision and baptized him. And he was, uh, went out in Arabia for three years to study the Scriptures to see about what this pillar of fire was that appeared to him. Now we find... That Paul, the rest of his life, had that for a tie post. He had met God face to face and was commissioned by God. What a tie post. What an absolute. That was the end of all arguments. That was the end of everything for Paul. All strife. Everything was gone. Well, I don't care what the Pharisees said, the Sadducees said, or anybody else. He met God vindicated by the Word. That settled it. That was the rest of his life. Because he had seen God manifested and had been proven to him that it was God by the Word and by the shape and form that he was in and by an audible voice that spoke to him. Exactly what it was. Now, that was a great thing. No wonder he could say before the uh, uh, Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He was tied to it. There was something real. Something that he knowed. Something that nobody could take away from him. Now today, if we're trusting only in uh, education or a, a mechanical way of, of education to explain the Bible, then we've only got it from a, a mental conception. But no man has a right behind this pulpit to preach the gospel unless he has come face to face with it. Like Moses on the back side of the desert. No matter how well he was educated, whatever had taken place, his fears and frustrations left because he stood on a sacred ground with God that nobody could take it away from him. And every man or woman that has an experience with God has met this same pillar of fire upon the sacred grounds of your heart. There is no theologian, no devil, no nothing. Paul said nothing present, nothing future. Death, sickness, sorrow can separate us from that love of God that's in Christ Jesus. It's a tie post. You know something happened. No matter how much science raised up and says this, that, other, you are tied. You and God become one. He's in you and you are in Him. At that day, you know what? I'm in the Father, the Father in me, I and you and you and me. You are tied to Him. And Paul had a, a Christ-centered life. It was a different life than he once had. He once had an educational conception. But now he's got a Christ-centered life, an absolute no matter how much a gripper could say, you, you've gone crazy, Paul. You lost your mind. You, you studied too much. He said, I am not mad. And then he got it on to a gripper in such a way till he said, thou almost persuadest me to be a Christian. He said, I wish you were only besides as I am, but these bonds. It makes you do things when you get a Christ-centered life like Paul had. Ordinarily, you wouldn't do. Now, look at ordinarily that man trained in all of the, the Scriptures and things. Ordinarily, he would have followed that line he was trained in. But when he become and made Christ his absolute, his ultimate, 
Then there was a different life. He did different. He done things crazy to what he once was trained to do. And it'll do the same thing. If the church would get away from that council of churches and come back and make God's Word their ultimate, make God's Word their tie post, that would do it. But they're tying to a man-made achievement. And it's bound to fall. Well, the Bible said they would do it. But there's going to be a bride that's been elected since the foundation of the world. It's going to be tied to that tie post. I can see eternity break come down into time since Eden. And when it did, there come a line of blood all the way up unto Calvary. And from Calvary, tied with this line, it goes on to the tie post, Jesus. And someday... When he comes to claim his own, everyone that's tied to that ultimate will be raised up into eternity. Why? They have been in eternity all the time. They were predestinated in eternity. They are part of God. They were in his thinking at the beginning. And when that big rope is pulled of the line of blood, that um, token I was speaking of, when it comes up from the earth, every one that was included in that blood will be dropped right up into eternity again. But the only way it will be, will be tied to that absolute Jesus Christ. It's absolute. Not an achievement of man, but God raised him up from the dead. And he is an absolute, and we know he's alive because here he is with us in the power of his resurrection doing the same thing he did when he was sure on earth. I'm tied to that ultimate. That's the end of all strife. I'm tied to it. That's my life. I was a sinner. And Christ saved me. I met something and since that came into me, it's been, it's been different. And I'm tied to it. Everything that I am is tied right there. And then God separating his life and let me live in Him, and Him and me. Then we're tied. I don't make any difference what others want to believe. To the individual, you are tied to that. That's your ultimate. That's the, that's the last word. And then if He is the Word, then this must be the last word. This must settle it. Whatever that says, that's that scarlet thread. That is Christ. And anything contrary to that, I know nothing about it. That's what we want to know is what this Word says. For I am tied to Christ and Christ is the Word. You get it now? And the portion of His Word is lauded for this day. His Holy Spirit is sure to manifest that portion of Word. Just like it was back there at His birth, Isaiah 9, 6. All down through the Scriptures, everything was spoke of Him, it was fulfilled. Over in the book of Luke, we say we see it that, and he was the end. He was the, he was the end of the prophecy to of him. He fulfilled that the history, the songs, everything in the Old Testament is spoke of him. It was fulfilled right there. That become the ultimate. That become the tie post of the word of God for that age, and the real born again people of this age. That's filled with the Holy Ghost is the tie post of this scripture that's got to be fulfilled in these last days. They are the ultimate. It's God's ultimate because it's His Word and the Word is Christ. The tie post. There's no way to get away from it. Something that holds you. As I said, it makes you do things that you ordinarily wouldn't do. It made Paul do things he ordinarily wouldn't do. It made Moses do things ordinarily he wouldn't do. It makes every man and woman do things they wouldn't do ordinarily. It's something that you are, are centered to. It's something that's your stabilizer. It's like the, it's the anchor to the ship. The ship is tied to the anchor in the time of a storm. And if Christ is your absolute, you're tied to Him. In time of trouble, the ship if they let it rock, it'll break against the, 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 the rocks. But what they do, they drop the anchor. The anchor drags until it snags into the rock foundation. 
And the ship is tied to the anchor. It's the absolute for the ship. And a born-again Christian is tied to Christ and the Bible is the anchor. It's the thing we're tied to. Let the organizations, let the different things, let the science, let the educators say anything they want. As long as that word says it and promise it, we're tied to that. There's something won't let us move from it. Right. A real born Christian. I stay with that word. If it says a certain thing to do and a way to do it, that's the way we must do it. No matter what anybody else says, that's what God said. We are tied to that. A Christ-centered life. Christ, again, is like the North Star. You know, the world turns around. And the stars, really, the one you see as the evening star is also the morning star. The world just turns around to it. But it shifts away from those stars. All but the North Star. Now, you can't set your compass up on the evening star and get anywhere. Because the next morning, one, you're an evening star in the west, and the next morning you're in the east. See, you can't do it. But you can set it on the North Star. Amen. A holder dead sinner. You'll come out. And that's what a Christ-centered life is. When you're lost, He is your North Star. Then if He is the North Star, the Holy Spirit is your compass. And the compass will only point to the North Star. It won't point to a creed or denomination. It won't point to a sensation or whatever it is. It'll hold steady to the North Star. He is your North Star. When you're lost, you might shift with denominations and things like that. But the compass, the Holy Spirit, will point you right straight to the Word, which is Christ. It holds you steady. Tired of that. What if there was no North Star? How would a mind ever find his way on a foggy sea? What if there was no Holy Spirit to direct you to the Word of God, to manifest it and prove it? What would we do in this hour? The Holy Spirit points only to the Word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Amen. Not part of the Word, but every word. Amen. All of it. Amen. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, that's what a man lives by. If He's your absolute in your life. He also is your North Star. You know, we have to have something or another to settle the end of strife. You know, there was a time that when table manners rested upon what a woman said. I believe her name is Emily Post. I may be wrong on that, I think. That's right, Emily Post. I don't care if Emily Post said, pick up your knife and eat the, the beans with it. That was manners. Why? She was the absolute of table manners. That's right. If she said, eat him with your hands, you eat him with your hands. Why? This nation made her the absolute to table manners. Yes, sir. There was a time when Germany had a, an absolute, and that was Hitler. It was an absolute. I don't care what anybody else said. When Hitler said, do it, you do it. You better. He's the last word. Hitler was. There was a time when Rome had an absolute. That was Mussolini, the dictator. A man drove up one minute early for him. He shot him in his car and jerked him out. Said, I never said a minute early. I said, be here on time. An absolute. Whatever he said, they had to do it. It had to turn. He said he'd make the whole world turn by his word. It turns by the word of God. There was a time when... Egypt had a, an absolute. It was Pharaoh. I went out in Egypt one time just to see those places. And you have to dig down 20 feet to find the thrones that they sat on. The emperor of Rome. One was in Rome and down in Egypt. See, it all turned back to historical dust because it was the wrong kind of absolute. That's right. It's wrong. It failed. It was man-made absolutes. And every man-made absolute and every man-made achievement must go to dust. They must go to dust. That's the wrong kind, so it fails. Just think of our nation. When we get in trouble, 
If somebody does something, and they try it here in maybe in a, a small court of the city, some police court, then it goes on, on, and finally it comes to the Supreme Court. Now the Supreme Court is the nation's absolute. That settles it. Now in Canada, our friends from Canada can go from Canada to the Queen. But in the United States, it's the Supreme Court. That's the absolute. Sometimes we don't like their decisions, but we have to listen to it anyhow. Yes, sir. We don't agree with it. We don't like the decision sometimes, but it's the absolute of this nation. The nation's tied to it. It's the end of all arguments. When that Supreme Court says you're guilty, you are guilty. We have to have it. We don't, we don't have a nation. What if we didn't have anything like that? Certainly, there's an absolute to everything. There's an absolute in a ball game. That's the umpire. Right. If he says it's a strike, that's what it is. <laughs> Don't care what you say. What I think, the way I saw it, the way you saw it, it's what he said. It's an absolute. If he says strike, you have to agree with it. Because that's where it's going to be wrote up. Strike. What if there was no umpire? Now who would be right? <laughs> One said it was a strike. The other said it was, wasn't a strike. It was a ball. It was a... Why, you'd have chaos. You wouldn't know what to do. There's got to be somewhere that somebody's word is final. Amen. Hey, man. I feel real good right now. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. There's got to be something that's final. I'm so glad of that. Oh, there's somebody who can say it's sin or it's not sin. I'm so glad of that. I'm glad for an absolute. No arguing. No need to argue. The umpire said strike. That's what it is. Just mark up your mind. It's a strike. Go on. When God says anything, that's the way it is. No need to argue about it. That's what it is. He said so. That's the Christian's absolute. That is, if he is a Christian. God said, do it this way. That's what it's got to be done. No Oregon. Well, say it was uh, nothing about it. God said so. That settles it. That's the absolute to the real believer. Uh, what if it wasn't something like that? Where would we be? Would the Methodist be right? Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, or what would be right? See? We'd have, that's the reason that you, you'd have chaos. That's the reason they turn loose with that absolute. That's the reason they're straying with these other stars. But there is an absolute. There has to be an absolute. There must be an absolute. And there is an absolute. That's the word. Now, what others say, it doesn't matter. Yes, sir. Now, if we didn't have an umpire in a ball game, everybody would be pulling one of his hair and fussing and fighting. See? That's the reason we need an absolute in Christianity. Stop just pulling hair and fussing and fighting. The Word said it and that settles it. Don't take to it or take away from it. Just leave it the way it is. You know, there's an absolute to the traffic. That's a stoplight. The traffic signal. What if some morning you don't work? Oh, my. Did you ever get one of them? I have. No doubt any driver has. What if that stoplight isn't working? Then everybody's fussing. They drive up there and say, I was here first. And I say, let me tell you something. I got to get to work. Oh, my. And women swinging pocketbooks and men fighting with fists. And you talk about a chaos. There has to be an absolute. Something says this is right and that's it. When that light said stop, it means stop. When it says go, it means go. If it isn't, you're in trouble. That's the way it is in Christian life. There's a stopping place. There's a going place. God's Word is that absolute. That's Christ. Yes, sir. If, you, if the traffic signals uh, are not on, then we got a traffic jam. And I think that's what we got up there in the uh, religious pedagogue today. A traffic jam of make-believers, unbelievers, and everything jammed together. You just got a traffic jam. Why? They don't have no absolute. 
One said, well, we're, we're the absolute. I said, we're the absolute. God's the absolute. He said, let every absolute otherwise than mine be a lie. Mine is the truth. So there's the absolute to Christianity. That's the end of all arguments. The Bible said so. That makes it right. Yes, sir. There must be an absolute in everything. Some is like the churches today. Most of the churches has their own absolute. Each one has his own. Something like the days of the judges. Every man done the way he thought was right. But that ain't right. See, that's when God's word and prophets wasn't in existence. The word is the absolute. They have their own absolute. Each one says they're the truth and the way. We are the truth and the way. But Jesus said he was the truth and the way. The truth, way, and light. Is that right? Well, then he is the word. So there's the absolute. And the denominational absolutes, nothing to it. It's wrong. Let it go. Now, man does right in his own sight, but God's got a way for him to do it. See, when God and His Word and His prophets were missing, every man done just as he wanted to do, and that's what's been in this day. Each one says, I, I belong to this. Are you a Christian? I'm Presbyterian. <laughs> Are you a Christian? I ask you. One girl said, I give you to understand I burn a candle every night. <laughs> Another man said in the prayer line, I asked if he's a Christian. said, I'm an American. How dare you? <laughs> like that's got anything to do with it. See? They're tied to a nation. The other's tied to an organization. Dogmas. But a Christian means Christ-like. Amen. And the only way you be Christ-like is for the Christ, the Word, to be in you. Amen. That's the ultimate. Yeah. I seen this before I was converted. I'm glad God got a hold of me before the church did. <laughs> so I knew when I, a fine Baptist minister, Brother Naylor, is in glory today. He come down, he talked to me, and oh, there's many people that talked to me when I, I was trying to find God. The Seventh-day Adventist preacher wanted me to join up with them and so forth. But I seen that if I was going to be a Christian, I, I couldn't say, it. now, I am a, a Seventh-day Adventist. Now, that's all right. Uh, I'm a Baptist. It's all right. See? But I had to have something a little more sure than that. I, I couldn't trust because each one was wavering. I thought there's somebody somewhere you have to have a something is true. Somewhere. So, I need the absolute, so I took one. God's Word. Amen. So I read in the Word that He is the Word. St. John 1. And upon this absolute, I'll build my church. Right. So I took Him at His Word. Revelation 22, 19 said, Whosoever shall take one word out of this or add one word to it. That's the absolute. Yeah. That's the end of all strife. This is the absolute. Whoever takes anything from it or adds anything to it, God said, always take his part out of the book of life. So that had to be the absolute. And Jesus said, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That I know this every word had to be. It said precept upon precept, line upon line. That's the way it has to come. Just as it's written. Then he said, if ye abide in me, he is the word. My word's abiding in you. You can ask what you will. I know then if Christianity was the word of God and he was the word, and by accepting the word, the word lived through him, then I know if ye abide me in my word and you, ask what you will. And if you are in the word and part of the word, you'll only ask what the word tells you to ask. Know the day you're living then. And ask accordingly. So therefore, back to the subject Makes, talk not this personally, but I'm tied. I am tied to Jesus Christ, to Him, by His Word. He's my absolute. I found that all these denominations and things had their absolute. Each one, each one, they had their own absolute. The Catholic, when that Pope says something, that's it. That's the absolute of the Catholic Church. I don't care what the priest says, what the bishop says, what the cardinal says. When the Pope says it, that's it. That's the absolute. Correctly. In a Methodist church, many of the Protestant denominations, what the bishop says, that's the absolute. That's all. What the creed says, that's the absolute. In the Pentecostals, it's what the general overseer says, whether you can have this person for a revival or not. That's the absolute. You disagree his words, you're kicked out of the organization. 
See, the word ain't considered at all. Amen. See, you get these absolutes. Each one having his own absolute. But you know, I don't say this sacrilegiously. I say it for truth. I feel like that way Paul did when he said in Acts 20, 24, none of these things move me. <laughs> I'm determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm not bothered about these absolutes where it's a pope, bishop, or a general overseer, or, or a counselor, or a system, or whatever it is. None of these things move me. I don't care if they say, well, we, we won't call. I don't make a bit of difference. I'm determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ, His Word made manifest among us. I'm tied to that. That's my anchor. I've anchored in that. Since I, Paul said, since I met him on the road, I've turned around. I've, I, he straightened me out. My, how he straightened me out. What a straightening he had to do on me. But since he straightened me out, I got tied to it. I've seen the word was truth. Everything contrary to it was wrong. You know what? He had a purpose in saving me. He had a purpose in saving you. And I'm determined by His will to do His will. Reason He's done it, I don't know why He's done it. Not add to it or take from it. As I said, Revelation 22, 19 said, don't do it. If He's our absolute, it cannot be otherwise. There's no way for it to be otherwise. He's got to be the absolute, the last word. You know, there were millions in sin when I got saved. He had a purpose in saving me. I'm the oddball amongst the brethren many times. Believes in predestination, seed of the serpent, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and all these other things that seems to be, and the visions and the power of Christ returned back and condemning organizations and things. I'm the oddball. But he had a reason to save me, a purpose for doing it. He saved me when there's millions of others in sin. But he saved me for some reason. There were educated men, there were smart men, there were theologians, there were bishops and doctors and so forth in the field when he saved me, but he saved me for some reason. And I see the word is the absolute and I'm tied to it and determined I'll know nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified. He had a reason for it and I'm determined to hold that reason. What anybody else says, I don't dis fellowship them or discredit them, but I know what I'm tied to. He wanted me like this. He had me like this. I was made like that for a purpose. I had to be made up with all these qualities and so forth and all these no counts so he could dig it out of me. Put something in there. That was his word. I'm determined I know nothing else about Christ. Christ's death was an absolute. It was an absolute. It was the end of all fear to them. That was the scared of death. His death is an absolute then. People feared death. Even Job feared death. But when he saw the vision, he knew everything was gone. His family, his, his children, even his wife had turned against him because his, his stench of his, of his boils, he set out of his house on an ash heap scraping his, his boils. And his wife even said, won't you curse God and die the death? He said, thou speakest like a foolish woman. Then when Elihu talked to him, some of these days I want to break that name down for you, Ella, he would show you it was Christ. When he had this condition and everything was gone against him, then he saw the vision of the just one. He wanted to find a man who could stand in the breach for him, put his hands on a sinful man, the holy God, and stand in the way. And God let him see it 4,000 years away. It was his absolute. Raised up and shook himself. Hallelujah. When a man scared of dying... Raise up and shake yourself. Look into the Word and see what the vision of God is. He seen that vision. He said, I know my Redeemer liveth. At the last days, He'll stand up on this earth. And I'm tying myself to it. Though the skin worms destroys this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. I'm tied to it, He said. He saw it. It was a promise of God. He looked through the laws of nature. as was telling you about the continuity of the law of nature, the continuity of the Word, the continuity of God's action. Everything is continuity. He'd asked in Job 14, 
He said, there's hope in a tree if it dies, a flower if it dies, and so forth. But said, man layeth down, he giveth up the ghost, he wastes away, his sons come to honor him, he perceiveth not. Oh, then he said, if thou will hide me in the grave, hide me away and keep me in the secret place till thy wrath be past. He was scared of death. But when he foresaw, being a prophet, saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he screamed out, my Redeemer liveth. Watch. He called him Redeemer. Watch. I know my Redeemer liveth. And at the last days he shall stand up on the earth, though after my skin worms destroys this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. God and the Redeemer was the same thing. God and man made one. I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes will behold and not another. Amen. Not nobody else but that Redeemer God. That's who my eyes behold. He's an absolute. He's the absolute. He takes all fears out of death. He takes all fears. In Hebrews, the second chapter, the 14th and 15th verse, watch. He took the form of man to die like one for all. He took the form of man. This Redeemer come down and was made man so he could die the one man for all man. Oh, how did he do it? What did God become a man for? To pay the penalty of man. But on Easter morning, he came forth with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Amen. God, who could die on a cross, the graves couldn't hold him. Nothing, hell couldn't hold him. Nothing could hold him. He rose. He had the keys. He rose a conqueror because he conquered both death, hell, grave. When he was on earth, he conquered sickness. He conquered everything. He conquered superstitions. He conquered everything there was to be conquered. And come out with death, hell, and the grave, the keys jingling at his side, and ascended on high and gave gifts to man and come back on the day of Pentecost and hand them over to Peter. To the church, amen. He is our absolute. All fears of death, because he lives, we live also. Romans 8, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We find out, uh, uh, I believe that's Romans 5. We find out, and, and he is our justification. God raised him up on the third day to justify our faith. And we believe it. And he raised him up to justify our faith. What did he do then? He sent him back, the justifier, because our faith believes it. The Holy Spirit Christ come into it for our justification because we have raised from death unto life. And now we are sons and daughters of God sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Justified us by his resurrection. That give us justification to know with the, with the earnest of our salvation within us now. The very life of Christ pulsating in us. And how then can we deny the Word? But she is the Word that gives us this assurance. The Holy Spirit is there. What is it? It's still that North Star. Though Christ is that North Star and the Holy Spirit is that justification. It points the believer right straight to the North Star. The Holy Ghost will always point to the Word. If it points to a creed or denomination, it is not the Holy Ghost. He couldn't do that, pouring away from His Word. When he died to confirm that word and make that word a positive. Amen. He died so he could come himself into that word. He is a quickening life that makes that word live again. That was his purpose of dying. That he could still project himself through his church and make every word through every age act just exactly the way it's supposed to act. He is the dynamics of the mechanics. The mechanics of the church. What is it? Apostles, prophets, teachers so forth. And he's the dynamics that works that and it's worked by a certain dynamic which is called like he, he's the fire that fires off the gas. He's the fire that and in a combustion chamber that when the, the gas, the, the word is poured over that combustion chamber, he's the one that sets her fire. He's the one that confirms it. He's the power of the resurrection. He is God. He, he's the power. That's what he is. Without controversy, said 1 Timothy 3.16, Great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifested in the flesh. Seen of angels, received up into glory. He was God come to take the sinner's place. Yes, sir, and when he, God raised him up on the, on the third day was for our justification. 
Therefore, exalted at the right hand of the majesty on high, he is an intercessor to make intercessions up on our, for our weaknesses as we confess it to him and die out to ourselves. Placing his word back in us, a promise, and our faith makes that word live because Christ is in us, the quickener to the word. Mm. I wish the church could see that. All oh, arguments and strife would be over. That would be the Supreme Court. That's a North Star. Hallelujah. That's the end of all strife. That's the end of all questions. That's the end of everything. God said so. That's the absolute. Tie yourself to it. Paul said there's nothing present, nothing future, death, sickness, nakedness, peril. Nothing can separate us from that. We tie to an absolute. Said for me to live is, is Christ and to die is gain. Nothing else holds but that there. That's the absolute. He is our absolute because we have the assurance of the resurrection because He's raised in us. How do we know? He lives. He does exactly hear what He did when He was here on earth. He's the same pillar far we got the picture of there. He's the same one in the church. He's here today and in this body He performs and acts exactly like He did then. If the life of a watermelon vine is put in a pumpkin, it'll never bear another pumpkin. It can't. Because it'll be a watermelon for the life in it is watermelon. And if my ye abide in me and my words in you, you act what you will, you'll have watermelons. Amen. The absolute I know it's truth. I've tied my soul into that and I know it's the truth. God's Word is our absolute. Second Thessalonians, the second chapter, we read that we will be caught up with our loved ones to meet him in the air. Oh, how my heart pulsates to every word in his book. Amen. God said we'll be caught up in the air to meet our loved ones. Amen, said the word. Down in my heart. For the words in there. I've hid thy word in my heart, Lord, that I sin not against you. I bind them upon my fingers, upon my bedpost. Thou art always before me. I shall not be moved. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For you are my absolute. I'll go down through that and you'll pull me out. I'll go into the deep waters of my ship. You're my anchor. Hey, man. You're behind the veil there. You're the one that'll stir me through the storm. You're the one who'll be there, my anchor in glory when I come down to the shadows of the valley of the shadows of death. When I come down to the Jordan, when I have to cross over, He is my absolute. I'm tied to the resurrected one on the other side. He'll pull me through the deep. I'll fear no evil for thy heart with me. Amen. Let the storms rage, life, death, whatever there is, nothing to say. I'm tied to that post. That post holds, it holds within the veil. It anchored. It anchored against God, it anchored against my heart. The Holy Spirit's what stirs me to that promise. I am, not I will, will be, I was, I someday will be, I am. The resurrection and life, saith God. He believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Let death do whatever it wants to. It'll never bother me. Because I am persuaded. I am persuaded that even a sickness that might take me, or a bullet from a gun someday might take me. I don't know what it'll be. What difference does it make to me? For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Oh my, because I'm determined I know Him sitting out across the river of death where He'll pull me into His presence someday. Justified by His righteousness that I accepted of His death upon the cross. God made flesh among us. Still flesh in us. Still spirit in our flesh. Amen. He's my absolute. He's my all. Anything outside of that, nothing in my arms I bring. I know nothing outside Christ and Him crucified. Don't want to hear nothing else but Christ and Him crucified. My heart says amen to every one of His promises. That's why I know His Holy Spirit is a compass. It guides me to the Word. Never has one of them visions ever said anything to me but what was right in that Word. Oh, that's where I got my assurance, brother. That night when He told me about that, I've watched those visions and I'll call your attention. Has that vision ever said anything that was contrary to the Word? Never a time has it ever been wrong. Why? It's God. That's my tie post. And I know one morning in a vision I see my loved ones across the river yonder. It's there. I'm bound for that promised land. I got to meet there someday. Yes, indeed. He's my absolute. He is my son. He is my life. He's my tie post, my north star. He's all that I could ever think to be. 
He is that to me. He's my life. Denominations, to me, not hurting your feelings. I don't want to do that. But the Word is like a two-edged sword. It can't push without cutting. Especially when it's cutting in darkness. Notice, denominations are like other stars. They shift with the turning of the world. That's right. Every way the world goes, they let their women cut their hair, wear shorts and everything else. It just shifts with Hollywood and everything else. Oh, brother! That still remains the truth. That unmovable word of the living God is still the truth. It's my absolute. What it says is the truth. Let the denomination shift anywhere they want to. They want to discredit the name of Jesus Christ with a title that's up to them. But to me, there's not another name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. To me, that's the foundation word. There is where the cornerstone is. I don't want to shift with no denomination. I've got my compass here within me. The Holy Spirit points me right straight to the absolute. For both heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Now I've hid it in my heart and the Holy Ghost pulling me right to it. I'm determined on anything else. That's my absolute. Just let it be like that. That's the way I want it. Oh my. Now, brother, sister, make your absolute in Him. Yes, sir. In a time of trouble I had here not long ago, lost wife, children, everything. Somebody said to me, he said, uh, did uh, you keep your religion? I said, no, he kept me. See? see, I had an absolute to know that someday I'll see him again. Amen. I couldn't have made it if I wouldn't have that absolute. It made the difference to me where I was tied because I know that I'd see him again. Now, by grace, I am tied to him that said, I am not I was, I am. Ever, ever present, omnipotent, omnipotent mission, omnipotent, uh, omnipotent, infinite. Hey, he is not I was, I am. He's still the resurrection. He's still the North Star. He's still everything to me. Moses had an absolute. When he met that burning bush, that was an absolute to him. When Joshua, when Joshua, oh, you know, sometime when you take an absolute, an absolute will lead you to a paradox. That's right. Yes, a paradox is something that's real but can't be explained. It's a paradox. When Joshua is standing there and seeing he had need, God had commissioned him to go there and take that land, whip out all them people, and, and put Israel in the land. And one day the armies got routed and out in the country, and the, and the first thing you know, he knew he had him whipped as long as he got him busted up. So when he did, the sun was going down. Joshua he was tied to an absolute. The Word of God, the Creator. He was tied to a job he had to do. Amen. Sometimes it ain't pleasant to have to do it. You have to hurt feelings, cut and chop, but it's an absolute. He had need. He said, Star, sun, you stand still. Moon, you hang right there. And for 24 hours, she stood still. Oh, talk about a paradox. But he was tied to an absolute with a commission. Yes, indeed, God had commissioned him. John was sure he would see the dove when he came up on him. When I seen that pillar of fire like Paul on the road down to Damascus, I know that was God's absolute. There was coming a revival and going to sweep the lands. I know it would forerun the second coming of Jesus Christ, and I believe it yet today. It's my absolute. Yeah. Though it was a paradox, sure it was a paradox, for a pillar of fire to hang up there in the sky and papers and everything, taking a picture of it. It's a paradox the other day on March the 15th or May the 15th. No, March the 15th this last year. When three or four months beforehand, sirs, what time is it? Said we go out there and seven angels will meet and come back and the, the book of the seven seals will be open. And standing right there with uh, Brother Fred Sopman just said amen there. Stand there by him while I told him there'd be a noise that shake the country. I said, it'll be there. It's thus saith the Lord's own tapes, tapes, tapes from Phoenix all the way around. It's thus saith the Lord. One day stand there picking the cucklebirds off or the little bullheaders off my legs like it was. There, that seven angels broke through from the sky and shook the place till rocks were weighing 50 or 60 pounds rolled down the hills. Line. There stood seven angels standing there commissioned to go back and to bring these messages and said one by one they would meet and tell what happened and it did exactly that way. And when they ascended up on high like that, went 30 miles high in the air and on the same day they took the picture of it, science did and went around the world. It's a paradox, but it's an absolute. It tied me tighter into Jesus Christ, winding my life into Him. 
I know it seems strange. It's always a, it was a paradox for Paul to meet Jesus on the road to Damascus. It's a paradox when God changes a black sinner's heart and washes it white in his own blood. It's a paradox. Certainly, you believe in paradox. And that paradox, if it's according to the Word of God, it can be your absolute. Paul's conversion was a paradox and become his absolute. Remember here some time ago, I was studying with an old druggist and we were talking in a little place. He said, uh, Brother Bram, I want to ask you something. And he was a Baptist. And he said, do you believe in a paradox? I said, sure. Certainly. He said, I wouldn't tell this to nobody else but you. He said, but I, I know you believe this. He said, during the time of the Depression, he said, they had to have an order from the county to get medicine for the sick. And said, one day I was sitting back here in a drugstore. said, my son was waiting on the customers and said, um, I seen a, a woman come in, said she was, uh, you can see she's going to be mother right away, and said, the little thing could hardly stand up, and her husband poorly dressed, both of them, and she leaned against the side of the counter, and he went over and asked my son, he said, uh, I've got a prescription here from the doctor. He said, would you fill it for me and let me take my wife on home? He said, uh, I try to let her stand that line. Just look down the street there. He said, it'll be four or five hours, and said, she's not able to stand now, you can see. And the young the fellow said, Sir, I, I can't do that. He said, I'll have to have that order first. He said, Because I, I can't do that. It's just against the rules. And said his daddy, said he was sitting back there listening, see what the boy said. And he said, Just a minute, son. What is that? And said he walked up there. And the old man, a real Christian, real sainted old man, he said, What is it, my good brother? And he said, Sir, he said, I'm my wife. She's just ready to, to, to deliver. And said, I, I am... I got the uh, order from the doctor. Here's some medicine. She must have it right now. And said, I, I took her down to stand in the room there and said, I, I looked at this line and said, I doubt whether I get in this afternoon. Said, I just wonder if, if you could fill this for me. Said, I, I'll stand down there. I'll, I'll get the money for you, the order that the county pays for it. Why? said, certainly, sir. I'll get it for you. And just laid the order down, went back. He said, this boy went on back and started waiting on somebody else. Said the little lady watched out two or three times. She was just standing there in perspiration on her face. Knew she was very sick. And the brother standing there with his arms around her. You know, saying, just hold up, honey. Now, just a little longer. So the good druggist is going to get us some medicine. He said, I fixed up the medicine as quick as I could and filled my prescription. And said, when I started to hand it in her hand, he said, Brother Branham, I looked. And I was putting it in a nail-scarred hand. He said, I seen the thorns on his brow. He said, I shut my eyes and I looked back. He said, I realized right then, in so much as I had done unto the least of these, my little ones, is done unto him. He said, do you believe that? I said, with all my heart, doctor, I believe every word of it. What is it? He said, since then, Christ has been more to me because doing that for that woman, said, it was a paradox. There's no doubt what ordinary people wouldn't believe that. But said, I thought, just tell it to you because I know you've had them experiences. I said, yes, sir. That's right. I said, I remember when St. Martin, reading of him, when he was just a, a boy, he's called a God, his people were pagans, and his father was a, was kind of a, oh, I don't know, I think a military man, and, and it's right for their boys to follow them. He said, one day going through the city there, I forget where it was now, and I think he was a Frenchman, and he said that he was going through the gap, and there's an old man laying there, a uh, 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 Freezing him to death, very cold weather, and people passed by, wouldn't give him nothing. And said he stood, and people as absolutely professing to be believers, and would go through and let the old man lay there, and he was begging for something to wrap him in. Said he was freezing to death. And St. Martin goes over there before his conversion now, took his own coat, being a soldier, and cut it half in two, and wrapped the old bum up in it like that, put the other around, people laughed. He said, a funny looking soldier with a half a coat on. See, it makes you do things strange. There's something in him that he believed that there was a God. That night, after he'd retired and slept a little while, woke up. Somebody woke him up. He looks down there by his bed, and there stood Jesus wrapped in another piece of coat. <laughs> that was the beginning of St. Martin. What was it? He had an absolute. That God's Word is true. What you do to these, my little ones, you do it unto me. Brother, I'm tied to that absolute. And I know that each one of you, instead of having an altar call this morning, I think I'd like to have a consecration call. Let's consecrate ourselves to this absolute. Do you believe the Word is God's absolute? Do you believe He's the same today as He ever was? There's ministers in here. Wouldn't you like to consecrate your lives? Just, let's take an absolute. What do we want today? What do we want with a fellowship card or credential? We want Jesus Christ. We're not tied to a fellowship card. We're tied to the Word of God, Jesus Christ. 
the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe that? Let's just raise to our feet now and consecrate our lives, Lord. I want mine also. I'm tying myself afresh. I'm checking my t- knots tied. I'm checking my absolute Lord. If there's anything in me besides Thy Word, take it out. I know nothing else but You. I want to know nothing else but You. Now, each one in your own way. I've been talking to you through the week. I've told you the truth. God's confirmed the truth. He's made it over and over and over again. You know what the absolute is. Now, to you and I together, all you women, all you men, boys, girls, whatever you are, let's all you choir, all, all you people up here, everywhere, together, down in the basement, up in the balcony, around the walls, back in the wing, wherever we are, let's take Jesus our absolute for we've got to come to the valleys of the shadow of death. I know nothing else but Him. He's my absolute because He's raised in my life. And I know He's real. Let's just raise up our hands now and pray. Let's make our consecration service. Lord Jesus, Your Word is from old. It's the beginning and the end. I now, with this congregation, consecrate myself anew over this pulpit today. I ask for this church the life tabernacle for our consecration. Settle all the differences. Let it all be gone. Bygones be bygones. Ministers of the gospel who's worried and thought something would take place. Oh God, we tie ourselves this morning to Jesus Christ the Word and determined to know nothing else but Christ and Him crucified. Oh North Star, oh Holy Spirit, oh compass of God, come now into every heart and we consecrate ourselves to You. Through Jesus Christ's name. Glory to God. Amen.